It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, uh, writing, drawing, character design, the all of the struggles and lifestyle that comes with this this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist, and with me today, we got we got a full full house again. Uh, we got an in studio guest. D Dave Carter has returned to the show. Hey, Jersey. <laughs> 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 I'm Dave Carter. I'm a comics librarian and video game archivist for the University of Michigan Library at the at the Duderstadt Duderstadt Center on North Campus. Beautiful and North Campus. Beautiful. It is. It is very lovely up there. Actually, yeah, yes, it's yeah. very hilly and pretty and full of you know, and less wooded. construction. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Downtown Ann Arbor right now is not quite so lovely because yes, as soon as the sun comes out, yes, the lovely shades of orange start going <laughs> up all over the place. <laughs> Everything falls apart, and all the Lego guys come out to start building things back up yeah. again. Um, but yes, we should say the the video game library is a library, and for those who are new to the show, because you've been on before to talk about this, it's a library of video game systems and yeah, games. Yeah, so we've got like uh, we've got more than 5,000 games. We've got more than 60 different systems. Um, our late, whoa, my audio just went out. Um, suddenly, suddenly Dave went ah, silent. You're okay. being censored. So <laughs> <laughs> ADL right. doesn't want people to know uh, about the video <laughs> game library. <laughs> so our, our latest acquisition, we got a Super Famicom. Uh, f from Japan, wow. so so, we, so I started to order a bunch of um, Super Famicom games, uh, released only in Japan. So if you can read Japanese, so the original Super Mario Two. Uh, I don't know if I've gotten that one yet. Or oh, not, but, but but I'll see what I can do about that. <laughs> I can tell you're chomping at the bit. You you should introduce your yes. Your I know. Here, I just so. wanted to, I want to make sure that people know that, that why is why is the video game guy on here? You're also the comic book librarian. Yes, I also select comics for the for the library. Yes. So. so okay, and on the Skypes. Uh, first time on the show, and I can't believe it's been. This is the first time we've had John, Jamie, Jamie Gamble, of Hi. Monkey Pipe Studios dot yeah. com. Um, <clears throat> gosh, how long have we known each other? Uh, probably going on four uh, years uh, now. I think it goes back like three or four years. Yeah, going back to the days of the the Art and Story podcast. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. all those yeah. those golden old days. But okay, so you are a writer. And oh, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I write a, a series of comics, superhero comics for a uh, imprint called Monkey Pipe Studios. Um, it's a micro uh, publisher. It's something I do that I am trying to extend into online and uh, create more digital presence and um, extend the universe, create a, a universe of superhero comics. And, um, so far, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we should talk about some of the books that we can find on there. So if people go to monkeypipestudios.com yeah, right perfect. now, monkeypipestudios.com you'll see I have a, a, um, some other uh, books that were they're kind of under the umbrella they're people that I've uh, collaborated with and worked with in the past and I've um, uh, given them space on the site to, to uh, promote their own books so there, there's a collection of books that don't build into the, the world that I've got but um, the main ones I do are Department O uh, Hero Code and the Black Wraith, and there's also an old book called Omnitarium, which was the first book that I put out to self-publish, and that's kind of hanging around still. Actually, I think I did a pinup for Omnitarium yes. years ago, and there's a video on my YouTube page of like the process of drawing that piece. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that was a great book, and I mean, all these books are great. Let's talk about some of the specific ones, like the Hero Code, mm -hmm. which you write, mm -hmm. and... Jonathan Rector draws it. Now, Jonathan Rector, for those, he's been mentioned on the show a bunch of times, and I've actually talked about the Hero Code on the show before. I, it was one of my picks for the reading recommendation section. Uh, Jonathan Rector, the energy that this guy puts into his yeah. pages is, is just insane. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I worry about him. I think he's, uh, he, he uses up a lot of energy. <laughs> he's all like... He's uh, it's it's um he did the first issue. Sadly, he couldn't continue. He got kind of caught out with uh, real life and other commitments. So um, that was one of the reasons I did the Black Wraith was because uh, we were trying to to make it work. We were trying to hold out for as long as we could. And I put out a, a standalone story and a couple of other issues of other stuff. Whilst I was waiting to see if he could uh, empty these other commitments, he was working on a book called The Standard, put out by Comics mm -hmm. Tribe. Uh, which is just finishing off six issue miniseries, um, and his day job. I think he shifted. He was doing work in retail, I believe, and then he got a job designing video game characters and oh wow, 
Um, yeah, so I think he went from having art as a, as a relaxation after their work to doing art at work <laughs> and then coming home and being faced with the, uh, the prospect of doing pages and yeah. it kind of hit a little harder than he thought it would. So um, I had to switch him out um, and start up again. Um, he did issue one, issue one still stands and it's, it's fantastic. It's such a great, you know, even though it's, it's work from, I think, four years ago now, I think he did the work on that. And, you know, trying to remember it was either 2010 or 2011 2011 i think is when the first issue came out and you can actually get it now at monkeypepstudios.com you can get it through comiXology you can get it through a mm -hmm. variety of different places which we're going to talk about a little bit but uh I, I want to start at the top of this idea of of like the hero code which is just like as i was saying before we started recording it's like just it's like rock and roll superheroes it's yeah. I, I don't mean like they're superheroes with guitars i mean like <laughs> it's just it's just straight unironic you know, uh, like classic superhero storytelling. And then same with the Black Wraith. The Black Wraith is like the sort of like the pulp hero with the kid's sidekick. He's like the, you know, he avenges by night, he fights bucket headed Nazis. <laughs> uh, and, and uh, you know, he's, he's, he's got like kind of cut from the cloth of guys like the Shadow, Zaro, Batman, uh, the Green Hornet, etc. Um, so I'm wondering, I mean, it's like, it's like uh, you've got a fascination with like the straight up pulpy superhero story. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's like a story behind that. Like, where does that come from? Um, I think there's, I mean, there's two kind of angles to it. One is that I, I grew up in, in England, in London in the 70s and 80s, and it wasn't a particularly colorful and fun place. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, the... the I, I kind of had two paths that I could go down with, with comic books, which was the, there was a strong um, anti-establishment punk movement in comics, and it was very rough and ready and angry at the people in charge. And um, at the same time that I was reading books like 2000 AD and Warrior and, and things that, that went down that path, I was also finding um, at Jumble Sales stacks of old Silver Age comic books and Bronze Age comic books. And, you know, I just... That, that was the world that, that, that I got into that was that like that Bill Mandlo and uh, J.M. Demetrius and, and creators like that who who gave they, they told character stories but the, the draping was always very colorful and, and traditional superhero stories you know it had gone through the crazy period of the Silver Age where it was science and sidekicks and then they come out this other side where it was character driven but superhero stories and, and that was really what what got me into comics in a massive way. So that that was your imprinting moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. And then, you know, I, I I'm not going to play a violin here, but it's it's I didn't have the 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 world is grim enough. You know, I don't need to add to the real world. And I think there is a tendency now, like you said before, that there's this kind of people feel like they they can't tell superhero stories because they have to ignore the absurdities of it. They have to kind of act like that didn't happen. And I think it's important to embrace that and get past it because that's where the good stories are. I think they're the other side of the absurdities rather than ignoring it and, and pretending it didn't happen. You wouldn't have to be referring to Mr. Goyer's remarks recently, would you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, it's the Martian Manhunt is a fantastic character and such a simple idea. It's someone who wants to learn about what humanity is so he tends to be human and yeah, yeah. Even, you know, it's <laughs> well, you you know you'll get no argument from me on that front. <laughs> we could violently disagree about this for like half an hour. <laughs> I'm sorry, we could violently agree about this for half an hour. Yeah. Vociferously yeah. agree. Yeah. And by the way, the Goyer thing I refer to for those who don't know, guy wrote Superman movie, said some funny funny things, uh, funny in the in the sense of quizzical. Uh, things about superhero comics and the people who read them. And if you just do a search, you'll find a lot of angry missives on the topic. <laughs> Did you read them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's well, it's probably not worth your time to read. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but uh, it, it is an example of a certain attitude out, out there um, yeah. about, about superheroes that it's, you know, for the, for the unwashed masses and, um, 
mm-hmm. the elites know better. Which, <laughs> which, you know, which is which is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it's for you know for the we're all three of us are all about the same age, and so yeah. we grew up on you know seeing Super Friends on on TV. Well, uh, I don't know if they had that in, in England, but well, oh, we yeah, certainly yeah. did. And you know, and Batman and Superman and Spider Man and and very very unironic way of of taking on uh, superheroes. Uh, the irony really hit. Know, late seventies to the mid eighties, I I think mm-hmm. is when that started coming into vogue. And you know, and when you're a teenager, at that sure. age, you're like, oh, oh my gosh, yeah. If Batman really existed, he would totally go and break that guy's pinky. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, how cathartic! Uh, how cathartic to see that finally happen. And, and then you get you know older, and you you know you can either you know forget the superheroes and, and, and leave them in your childhood or you can I think come back around and embrace the, the purity of, of the concept of, yeah. of the superhero which um, it sounds like the three of us again here sitting in this yeah. room have, have sort of done that you know full circle come around and you know, I just I just finally saw the Lego movie the other night. I've, I haven't seen it yet, so... Oh, my God. It is nearly perfect. Oh, yeah? It is nearly... A, for me, it is nearly a perfect movie. And the last... <laughs> I want to say the last 20 minutes of the film, I, I, I had this unique experience where, A, I wasn't analyzing the story. That rarely happens when I'm watching a movie, right? Like, I was actually so drawn in that I was just experiencing it and not doing that analytic eye thing where I'm like, oh, I wonder where they're going with this, and right. I wonder why they did that, you know, uh, but, like, tears and laughter at the same time, where I'm both crying and laughing about what's happening at the same time, oh my gosh, so good, and and the thing was, the hero smiles, <laughs> <laughs> he's not mad about anything, <laughs> almost for the whole film, I don't think that yeah, I mean, he isn't he, smiling or just being there and being involved in what's going on in a, a really light way, in a really fantastic way. Yeah, yeah, he has his ups and downs like a, a hero should, but like he engages with the struggle in this kind of like, you know, uh, I don't want to say flippantly optimistic, but in this optimistic way. And and it just the whole tone of the film was like, it, there were scary parts, man. I mean, like uh, Cloud Cuckoo Land, that whole scene that, that the, the bad thing they have is there, intense. But uh, but anyway, yeah, it's just like that that the like, and I'm watching that going like, why can't superhero f- movies feel like this for me? Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. but but to go back to talking about you, Jamie, and in your work is so you, we've established you've got this love of like the colorful, like you know, um, you know, bombastic superhero story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Self publishing. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so here's where I get to, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow some style from my friend Greg Shegel, who does the Stuff Said Show uh, podcast, fantastic podcast. Everybody should listen to stuff stuffsaidshow.com. Finish this one first, though. Uh, <laughs> you you're doing superhero comics, and you are doing you're self publishing them, so you're trying to reach new audiences, obviously, with this kind of thing. Um, hmm. So superhero comics, that that audience is being serviced. We got Jeff Johns, Jamie. What do we need you for? After all, we've got Dan Slot. We don't need any more superhero. I got my. I'm a Superman man. My son's gonna be a Superman man, and his son's gonna be a Superman man. Uh, how do you? Because I ran into this with with when I was doing the front of the, this this graphic novel I did, which was superheroes, but it was like my kind of way of doing it. And and like I'm trying to reach new audiences, so I go to indie shows and like, oh, superheroes, whatever. A guy's got laser coming out of his eyes. Uh, and I'm, this is this is not for me. And then I go to the traditional comic shows, and they'd be like, what's this? This isn't Aquaman. I'm an Aquaman man. Get out of here, punk. Yeah. So, question from a self-publisher standpoint: How do you think about differentiating yourself and positioning yourself so as not to, or so as to get past those two resistance points when you're doing superhero work? Um, I think I've kind of I've been lucky in a way in that the mainstream superhero community is kind of doing a lot of the work for me. They're they're restricting their market so much, and they've kind of collapsed it down to um, the only way that they can keep service in the characters and the, and the fans of the characters that they have is to either uh, create new ideas on the old characters, which for me have kind of run their course. The stories have run their course, and they're they're kind of rehashing old ground a lot of the time, and also by convincing people that there's um, value in product that's already out there. So they've, they've, they've gone back to the speculator market in a massive way. Mm. Uh, but I think the, the biggest problem that they have, and, and this is uh, to my benefit in a massive way, is that their, their target audience is restricted down to 
white 30 to 40 year old males that are the, the comics just don't work for kids anymore you know and i know there's always the old comics aren't for kids comics are for kids comics should be for everybody right um, there's schools that always argue and um i think they like if you pick up a dc book or a marvel book most of them are t plus um most of them are priced in a way that isn't accessible for kids to get a lot of them, but they are written in a way that you need to read a lot of them to follow a story. And a lot of the time, the content is very much um, not suitable for everyone. And they've also alienated a lot of female readers. Um, and I've found that, uh, especially the Black Rape has is, is become, there's a lot of uh, uh, females that really enjoy that character. They really like the, the tone and the style and the the world that he exists in and um so it's it's interesting the shows i've been to i still hit the same walls i still hit people coming up and they're saying who is this that looks like that guy i'm not going to bother reading that you know <laughs> and you know you really see if you if you have prints uh, any kind of comic book show then you know if, unless it's superman batman wolverine etc etc deadpool you don't have a chance in anyone being interested they might come by and say oh that's a nice image and then they move on that's the, the best that you get. But um, even with that going on, I've still found that there are, there's a group of people that still come up and say, that reminds me of stuff I used to read. I'm, I'll read that because I haven't read a DC or Marvel book for five years, 10 years, however long. And you know, the Jeff Johns and, and Dan Slott do their work very well, but they're also, it's kind of become like a jocks and geeks thing almost where their world is like the, the jock geek and uh, <laughs> people just want to read for fun or the geek geek or, or whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to term it, have, have been either picking up classic stuff or going back and reading old stuff or they're looking for new stuff that is in that style. And I think it, it kind of works. It kind of works to, to that audience to, to kind of pick up, what the mainstream comics have, have ignored and, and left behind. I think you just discovered the new advertising strategy for DC Comics. <laughs> Are you a bad enough dude to read our comics? <laughs> <laughs> and they get Jocko, the Energizer guy. Remember him? <laughs> the Australian guy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just him lifting weights like, Are you man enough for comics? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it, It's okay. almost like they... they they don't want to be seen as as geeky anymore. You know, yeah. they want, it's like, look how tough these guys are. Yeah. You know, they they get women, they hit people. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they get women, they hit people. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's the blurb for every. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> that's okay in small doses, but you don't want that to be your entire entertainment. You know. Mm -mm. buffet no when <laughs> you want to be able to <laughs> we've lost jersey you know you want to be able to go up to that buffet and say oh you know today i i feel like romantic comedy superheroes or i feel like retro throwback superheroes or i feel like superheroes for kids and uh, yeah. if, and so yeah. having more than two companies doing superheroes i i think can when a company gets in that you know tunnel vision way of, of doing their product and it is product Mm -hmm. um, then you can, you know, you have advantages, you know, um, you can do whatever you want with the Black Wraith. You know, there's no corporate overlord saying Batman wouldn't do that and, yep. and changing their mind from week to week what Batman is going to do. So you don't know. <laughs> what we need to change do. the costume so he matches what looks like in the movie. Right. Or yeah. anything like, anything like that. You know, it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's your, your creation. You can do what you want to with it. Sure, sure. But yeah, but I think the thing that's interesting about, and like, at least in my experience, Jamie, and you can like chime in with it, whether yours is uh, harmonious with this or discordant with this, is this sense that when you're doing something that feels a little like it's in the same pool as something else that is well known, you can feel like the outsider screaming in, like, how do I make people realize how mine is different? Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And there is a tendency. There's, I think this is um, there's a problem with a lot of comics is that they they become obsessed with the pitch or with the thing that makes it different and with the, the selling point. And, um, you know, that they forget that there is a story. There is something that you need to have. You need to have a start and a finish. And I think that uh, it, with superhero stuff, there is a natural start and finish with these things. These characters, I, the, the perpetuity of, of Batman and Superman has kind of run its course in a massive way that, 
you know, the, the fact that they had to reset the entire line of DC Comics to make it seem fresh is, is kind of indicative of that. But it's, it's, if you treat it like there is a story, like these are real people and that they have real personalities and they have a start and a finish, then I think the, the interplay becomes more interesting throughout it and the, the writing becomes more interesting. And, and then, you know, it's the, the artist brings it into the, the four color world and the, the classical look. And then you, you have what I used to read, which was, you know, you, you pick up a copy of um, like the defenders. I don't know if you, if you ever read that. Oh book. yeah. Yeah. That was a great comic. The, yeah. It was a great book and it had all these crazy uh, supernatural elements and stuff like that, but it was still, I remember sitting there for ages reading a single issue because it was two people talking about their feelings whilst they were fighting a demon or they were doing something. <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was what made it more real for me. And the, the Justice League books were always about the interplay of the characters rather than the event. The event was just like I'm, the, I'm assuming that you've read the uh, Defenders that came out, what, like probably like 10 years ago by Busiek yeah. and Larson and Salvi Sama. Oh my gosh, that thing was just like a revelation. Like yeah. I, I saw it on the shelf and I'm like I'm like that looks really hey it's Larson I love Larson's work and then I open it up I'm like oh oh this is what comics felt like when I was a kid <laughs> <laughs> and that one issue that ended with the Hulk and Orca the killer whale punching each other at the bottom of the ocean and, the, and it was just like and you knew they were gonna fight forever because like Hulk's like keep on punching me because the angrier I get the stronger I get and the Orca's like well keep on punching me because the more whales I summon the stronger I get and that's how it ends just with them <laughs> fighting at the bottom of the ocean forever yeah. <laughs> and then next issue like doesn't reference that at all no, right they just, they just start another day. <laughs> yeah that's fantastic <laughs> i don't need to see how that fight ends i just need to know that it happened because the fight i see in the page probably won't be as good as the fight that just happened in my mind well that's right? true yeah but but i mean this is the kind of stuff that, that you find in things like the black wraith like when i'm reading it like you're seeing they're fighting bucket-headed nazis and not, not in an ironic way and like you know evil women named the red pen and uh and while they're having this awesome fight scene the black wraith and his sidekick are having a discussion right they're having character in exchanges and inter in interactions while this is happening and that's another thing that's like really refreshing to see is like um dialogue <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dialogue that reveals character that that, that I, I hate to say it but that is a refreshing thing to see in superhero comics you know yeah uh, yeah and i know there's, there's a there's a kind of fear of um it, it, people have got so obsessed with a, a period in comics that was a success outside of comics mm -hmm. um that they feel like they have to keep aspiring to that and it's that that was a moment that was a moment that happened and there's been moments in the past where successful things happen like the, the um, when Marvel launched that was a huge success um, but that was in the past that that worked at that period and then they moved on and then you know you have the, the 80s series of books and Frank Miller and Alan Moore and people like that that was a moment that was them doing their best work at that time mm -hmm. um, and now you have this kind of weird obsession with trying to convince people that this could happen in real life and it's it, it can't it, it's, that's the joy of it it's, it's comics they shouldn't happen in real life and now there's that it, you combine that with that need to make everything cinematic and and, yeah. and uh, speak to an audience that is used to a, a certain style when you jest an entire model of, uh, of work and, and, and a method of telling a story that, that doesn't work and you know it's it, there's too many people prodding the the beast and it's kind of saying well that wouldn't work that wouldn't work and it's forgetting what does work and what works well for that that yeah. method, that storytelling method. I, I got told that um, um, someone said that one of my books was too wordy, and I was kind of proud. That's <laughs> 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 complaint. It's you know, it's that they should be. You should sit down and read them for a long while. Right? Actually, it's funny. One of the, my my book recommendations I got this week uh, is it, one of the reasons I chose it is because I, I like to t point out how it has a really good image and text density. Mm. You know, and <laughs> and, and like it, it's 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 so weird that we have to say that now. But yeah, yeah, you know, when I see comics where like there's no sound elements at all, and they're like, "Well, I'm letting the images tell the story." I'm like, "Yeah, but sound elements and dialogue are image elements as well, and they can be used for composition, and they can also be used to reveal things about the characters' motivations, <laughs> and they can give you like an extra texture to the story." And uh, I don't know about you guys, but um, you know, my favorite books. I hear the characters' voices when I'm reading them, right? Like, yeah, when yeah. you think of Benjamin Grimm, the thing, you hear Jack Kirby's voice <laughs> coming out of that guy, right? So, yeah.
it's done well. It's done really well. But anyway, I, I want to I want to think of this idea about self publishing. So you're self publishing. Yes. And as I was thinking about this topic uh, in the lead up to the show, I was like, well, what's changed the most in uh, the last 10, 20 years? And I wrote down this list. <laughs> So 1994, and when I when I was really first starting out in you know self publishing comics, we had Diamond, and we had a handful of other smaller distribution channels. So was Capital dead by then? No, not yet. So there's Diamond and Capital. They were both um, nationwide distributors. Yeah. Then you had your lots of regional distributors. Yeah, like Friendly Franks and yeah, a few yeah, other ones yeah. like that. Yeah. So you had that, and then you had mini comics and zines, right? Right. And then you had conventions. That was really the three avenues you had at that time if you were going to go into self-publishing, I think. Pretty much, yeah. Okay, let's fast forward to 2004. And now we're getting into the, you know, like the bold new age. All right, we got Diamond. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because they, they, there was like the, the whole distributor wars that happened. It was a big crossover event. And, <laughs> <laughs> and only Diamond survived. <laughs> and things will never be the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The high evolutionary came down and said, oh, Diamond, you get to win. And nobody else gets to win. Uh, and then we had mini comics and zines, you know. And then we had web comics. All right, we got web comics now, and uh, we had conventions. And as far as I know, that was pretty, still pretty much it, right? Is we didn't really have the POD, the self publish or the the print on demand stuff for another couple of years yet. Yeah, it, was, it was like 2006, I think. Yeah, I, I, yeah it was, I mean, it was very nascent if it existed. Yeah, then, I think so. comics, comics press, or com yeah. Yeah, was, that, was, was that the first one? That was like 2004, 2005, but it was like, yeah. it was very rugged at that time. And it had a really bad reputation because it was so, um, they were learning as they were going and they, they got a very bad reputation, which I think hurt them in a massive way. So. Yeah, yeah, it was a rocky start, I remember. I remember mm. a lot of people were very frustrated. And, and let's face it, like cartoonists, and Jamie, you work with cartoonists all the time, we can be a very needy emotional lot at times <laughs> i'm sure sometimes I'm, I'm sure at times that the complaints were legit but then i also saw a lot of complaints where it was like wow you know this didn't happen yeah. the way i thought it would i'm gonna make a big public temper tantrum out of the thing yeah um, okay let's go 10 more years forward jump into the tardis and what do we got now 2014 we've got diamond we've got mini comics and zines we've got conventions and web comics but now we got print on demand we got kablam we got amazon create space we've got uh kindle direct publishing we got Comixology, we got iBooks, we got Google Books, we got Kickstarter, we got Patreon, we got Gumroad, we got Cellify, Etsy. drive through Comics is a place where you can get the Black Wraith as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So we got all this stuff now. All right, an embarrassment of riches. <laughs> <laughs> which, which means... <laughs> which means... <laughs> Jamie works a day job, right? I mean, you are... You work, you work in television, glamorous television. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> You can follow my Instagram to see some of the production shots. I mean, actually, you know, I, I think it's pretty cool that you work as a sound guy uh, because as a guy who like, thinks about sound a lot in my comics, I'm sure you think about sound a lot. Yeah, um, that's always been my, my obsession when I was a kid. When I went to see Star Wars, that was the thing I came out. It wasn't the special effects. It was the sound effects that, that really sold me on that movie. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, because like, like, I can listen to like Ben Burt's commentary on the sounds he did in Star Wars like for yeah. days. Yeah. yeah. I watched the, the um, uh, was it the Clone Wars, the, the animated series? That, mm -hmm. And I, I was just, I was so into that series purely because they used all the sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even care what the story Closed your eyes and just sat there and listened to the show? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I remember right, like going back a pace like to the art and story days, I remember when we were trying to upgrade our equipment and mm -hmm. we were getting a lot of feedback from listeners saying, like, we don't care about the sound quality. All we care about is the content. You can do it <laughs> as raw as you want to. And I remember thinking, like, oh, we really should sound better. And I think you were one of the only guys who came out and said, no, if it sounds really good, it actually makes it a more pleasurable experience to listen to the thing. Please, you know, get better equipment. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah. So like, you think about sound a lot, which actually I think trickles down into your comics when you read them, because like, there's sound effects in there too, which is so exciting. But um, <laughs> okay, but you got a day job and you have children. You know, I mean, you're a dad, you're working, and then you're trying to do this comics thing. You're trying to write them. Got to be creative. I got to come home. I got to get into the zone. I got to write some things, and I got to negotiate with artists and work with artists. And then you know, this guy didn't understand this in the script. Oh, he gave me the page, and it looks all weird. Oh, the colorist did this panel. So you're doing a lot of stuff. And now you have to think about all this other stuff 
You know, <laughs> am I going to get it through, uh, carried through Diamond? Am I going to do his uh, Ashcan mini comic? What conventions am I going to hit? I got to get the Amazon version up. I got to get the Comixology version up. Um, so, first big question. Mm -hmm. When all these new services and platforms come out, and there's going to be more, right? Patreon yeah. is new, and you're on Patreon, actually. It's mm -hmm. uh, patreon.com slash Jamie Gamble, right? Yes. Okay, that's where you can support uh, this stuff. Um, what's your initial reaction when one of these new services come out, right? Like, it, it, what I mean by this is, like, are, are you, like, I don't know, I better wait and see, or are you, like, oh, this is interesting, I might take a look, or are you excited, like, all right, another thing I get to try, or, or is it more like, oh, <laughs> I got to do another thing. <laughs> what, what's Jamie Gamble's initial, I want to get your worldview on navigating yeah. all this stuff. What's your initial reaction when one of these new things comes out? Um, I, sometimes it's all of them. Um, it, <laughs> it, for me, it tends to be more like, uh, I like I like new things happening. I like seeing what the new things um, can offer and, um, you know, what, what their spin on the new on the old idea is um i'm not trying to claim i'm a pioneer or anything but i'm not i don't like waiting to see if something is going to be a success i want to try it and see for myself because um you know one man's success is another man's failure and you, you never know what you're going to get you never know what person is going to be interested in your work and how they found it so i i find i find trying it fascinating i've always been obsessed with statistics and numbers and stuff like that anyway so it kind of plays into that obsession for me where I can look up things and see stats as they happen and, and you know Gumroad is a really good one for that because you're you're instantly told if someone buys it and how many people are looking at it and how much they're paying and stuff like that so there's all these, these uh, numerics that, that I find fascinating um, so I, I like trying new things I think there is a I try not to uh, spread it too thin on similar um, models and similar uh, systems of delivery. And I think there's enough difference between Gumroad, Drive Through, Comixology, and Patreon to to justify putting something the same thing on all of those. And there's no um, um, exclusivity to any of them as well, which I, I find interesting. And there's there's little tweaks that you can do in each of them where you offer different. Uh, versions of the same thing across that platform. Mm. So I, I like playing around with new things. I like looking at the, the new delivery methods and the new techniques of getting stuff out there. Um, there is, I mean, the, the, the Comixology one especially has been a steep learning curve for me. I'm, I know enough about um, uh, Illustrator and a few other programs from a couple of office jobs that I've had in the past and, and uh, design stuff that I've done in the past that I can play around with it, but I am terrified of uh, doing too much with it. And and um, Comixology was really they have a very strict criteria for the stuff. They have a real um, high benchmark for their stuff for the, the quality of the product, and not not just the the creative quality, but the actual um, uh, product quality. So you're preparing the pages in Adobe Illustrator for submission to Comixology. Mm -hmm. I actually was doing a really roundabout way. I was um, uh, the process I have is that I have the, the scripts are all collected in one place, normally on Google Drive, um, and then I share those out with the people that I'm working with, the collaborating uh, team, and then the artist will deliver them through Box, um, and um, that allows us to uh, comment back and forth and discuss stuff um, whilst I'm at, at work because you, you can do it on your phone and stuff like that. Um, and I, you can preview pages and, and so forth. And then once they've done that, it goes to um, the colorist who does their work. And I think they probably do their stuff in um, Photoshop. And then it goes to the letterer who does it in Illustrator. And then what I get is um, uploaded. I get the kind of oversized raw page that is the, the finished page. But I still need to share, size it to make sure it fits to the spec of everything that I'm going through and make sure that everything is CMYK or RGB or go through all that process. And um, what I was doing was I was going into Illustrator, resizing the pages in Illustrator to go into a traditional print comic book size. Then I was opening up um, a graphics converter and going into that and then resizing them to the Comixology spec, uh, which they have a, a minimum width, uh, pixel width 
that each page has to be. And when I was doing that, I think I was uh, converting from TIFF to JPEG and then going into iCombiner to create a PDF that I would send to them. <laughs> it was oh my gosh. A, it was completely convoluted. And I think I, I had a couple of rejections from Comixology where there was issues of pixelation and, and it's something in that process that was uh, compressing somewhere that I didn't need to do. And I, I since, with their help, they were very helpful. They sent me a guideline and I've gone through some other processes and spoken to a few people on Twitter and they've been very helpful as well. Um, I basically moved everything into um, uh, InDesign and do everything there. Create okay, them, yeah. Put them there and then just drop all of the original tips in there and shape them in there and size them in there and then create a PDF from that. And it's it saved me a lot of time. <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna ask like, are you still using this Rube Goldberg machine <laughs> to, to make your comics? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, I've, I've now, I'm now doing that, and that has saved me a lot of time. It means that the files are a lot bigger, and that's um, you know that's that's the main thing now is that I have I have two I have like everything I save everything as the raw individual TIFF pages that I can go back to at any point if I need to adjust anything. But then I create a PDF for print, and I create a PDF for digital, and they go to the different services from there. And your InDesign becomes sort of like your master file. Exactly, yeah. To. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, oh, wow. So I, I wonder if uh, we can dig at that Comixology thing just for a few minutes. Is like, yeah. uh, because I have zero experience with Comixology, and I've been meaning to try out the platform for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have it, and I buy comics on it, but I haven't put my comics on it. Yeah. Um, how, how has your experience been overall? I mean, is this a place where you would say, like, hey, if you're an... Because I, I, I was under the, one of the reasons I was dragging my feet is I was under the impression that, oh, it's kind of a DC Marvel place. It's a place mm -hmm. for, if you're doing... You know, <laughs> what was that you said again, David? <laughs> I, get the, I get lots of girls that I hit people. <laughs> where, I thought that was the place where you go to get those kind of books mostly. And I found some independent stuff on there, too. Yeah. But, but uh, but I thought like really the audience was the 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 hitting people comics. Um, so what what was, what was your reaction to that? Well, your experience. I think, uh, yeah, I, there's definitely that that is a, a big part of it. But I think the there's um, they they release the the global charts for stuff, and you can see a real difference from country to country what interests people. Um, and I think the, the two main things for me is, one, the Comixology Submit is the independent imprint there, or the independent arm of, of Comixology, which is where um, all my stuff goes up on there, and, and there's a lot more interesting and, and uh, diverse stuff um, offered there. But the other thing is the, the scope and scale of, of um, or the, the reach that they give you as a creator is, is massive. It's it's you know it's the only player in town by far. It's everything else has kind of collapsed down. Graphically was was around for a while and that is now gone. Mm -hmm. um, drive through is is very good, but it seems like it's a very um, small niche area of the, the internet that, that people go to uh, to get their books from there. Um, but Comicsology definitely has the reach that is it's it's the equivalent of getting into Diamond. You know, it's it's getting your book in front of a lot of eyes and a lot more people than you normally could. And I think that because of the combination of it being a global app and the, the scale of what they, um, of how they offer it, um, I think that opens it up a lot more than, than people realize. I think we have a tendency in the US and in and many ways in the UK as well um, to think that comics are superheroes and that is the be all and, and end all. Um, but you can look on submit and you can see that they, you know, that, that is still, if you go to the Comicsology homepage, it, it, nine times out of ten it will be a picture of Batman or Wolverine up there. But I wonder if that's different around the world. And, um, and you can see in the charts as well, there are books that um, chart a lot higher than Batman and Superman in, in different parts of the world. You know, in India, Brazil, Russia, places like that, it's, it's a definite... Uh, desire for something outside of the realm of superheroes and Marvel and DC. Hmm. Yeah, that that is an interesting thing to point out is the the global aspect. That mm. I, I admit I wasn't even thinking about that. Uh, I was thinking of it as, as a national thing. That's that's silly. <laughs> how how twentieth century of me. <laughs> uh, so. 
So you can actually, and that's another thing, you get like some, some measurement and statistics. You get, you get like a feedback yep. loop on how well the stuff is doing there. You Which, do. It's, you get a quarterly report. Okay. Um, and that breaks down, that shows you each individual purchase of the book and which country it was bought in. Um, and um, the way they work, um, off the top of my head, I think it's something like a, the payout system is that one, you, you have a, an account with them and once your, um, your money earned goes over $100, you get a payout from them or you get sent a payment from them and you set up with them. So there is a lot of times where you're, you know, you, you're six or nine months of watching these numbers slowly creep up because they're <laughs> out there. But, but yeah, you do get a breakdown. You get a very good quality breakdown of everything. I got um, um, Department O was part of the South by Southwest package. They offered a package at South by Southwest, which was... I think it was like a hundred titles, maybe fifty or a hundred titles for ten dollars um, through the submit service because it was it was very uh, it was pushing the indie side of it. Oh, that's cool. Um, and yeah, I got a, a book on the department I got through that, and I haven't seen the official quarterly report, but I have. I know a few people who also had their books on there, and they said that there was around five thousand. Uh, downloads of, of that package so the book was out to 5,000 people so it'll be interesting to see I know that's a huge spike from what I normally move on there but it'll be interesting <laughs> to see <laughs> yeah. okay well this brings up another thing you're talking about you've got global reach they have the reach it's yeah. like getting into diamond was language yeah. they said um, I had a book in diamond once uh, <laughs> and uh, I think I sold, I, th I think it was like four copies that I sold. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And so, I mean, like, you know, it's like, yeah, you got a numbers game going on here where it's like, wow, a lot of people are using this app and interact mm -hmm. with it. But then how do you get your stuff noticed? Now, this is why I want to go diverge on a slightly uh, parallel uh, or, or tributary topic to this. <laughs> Is that Dave? Before we started recording, yeah. we were talking about. I said to you, I was like, "Oh, well, how do you? Where do you order books for your library?" Because like, when we did an episode a long time ago, "Know Your Selector," which is the name of the episode, I'll look it up for the show notes, uh, where I talked to Sharon Iverson about how to get your books into public libraries. Right. You work in a university library, which is a different animal. Right. And so I was like, "Oh, well, you probably go through Baker and Taylor or Ingram or something like that." You're like, "No, I go through Diamond." Yeah. So um, I mean, because I'm buying for a different purpose than the public libraries are. Right, uh, most public. I can't speak for all public libraries. So I'm going to speak very generally here. So, so you'll forgive me if your particular situation. He's Dave reads comics on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so direct all your hate mail. <laughs> your hate tweets only hundred. My library is not like that, <laughs> Mr. Carter. <laughs> anyway, but continue. But, but sorry. Generally, they're looking for for stuff for you. Yeah, they want them to circulate. You know, you're gonna buy stuff. You want it to circulate as much as possible. You want to get the popular stuff in there, and you want to get. You know, they're like. Here's the stuff that's good for you, and here's the stuff that's really popular. And hopefully, there's some overlap in there between the the good for you and popular stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, you know, the public library, especially like for popular series for uh, for a system like Ann Arbor, you know, they're going to be buying multiple copies of something, and they're gonna they're gonna be around on the shelf for maybe a couple years. You know, they'll go through if it's popular, it'll get circulated a lot, and it'll fall apart. If it's not popular, it'll sit there on the shelf and it'll get weeded after, after yeah. a year because nobody's checking it out, yeah. and then it'll go away. Um, I'm buying stuff, you know, it's a tier one academic research library. Um, so we have, not only do we want to buy stuff that people want right now, we're, I'm also trying to imagine what people are going to want 20, 30 years from now, what they're going to want to get then. Um, and I'm buying, you know, f for chiefly for an academic audience. Um, and you know we've got a collection. I've got a collection development statement which says you know these are the sorts of things that we're looking for, and I'm looking for um, stuff that's creator driven, stuff that's um, you know independent kinds of stuff, um, stuff that is you know, representing um, uh, pe people and, and and cultures and stuff that aren't tradition have not traditionally been represented in comics. Uh, so I got kind of a lot of things that, I, that I'm going through. Um, and um, so the bakers and tailors of the world who are really catering towards that public library audience, they're not necessarily carrying the sorts of stuff that I want. You know, I, I can't, I don't know, I haven't checked, but I, there's not too much of the, the small indie publishers in there, not too much no-brow no press that you're going to find in there. Right, and, right. And those sorts of things. That's the kind of stuff that I want. 
Uh, well, I can find a lot of that stuff in Diamond. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we actually order our stuff through Vault of Midnight, which is the, with the big comic store here in Ann Arbor. So every month I'm going through previews. I'm skipping over most of the DC stuff. Well, mm. I order a few things out of the front of the catalog, you know, because, yeah. you know, there's some interesting stuff in there and some, uh, sure. things. Um, I'm, I just, I'm not going to paint with a big brush and say everything that Dark Horse publishes is crap because it's <laughs> clearly not the case. No, th th then, then we're, we've joined the dark side. Right. When we start talking like that. Like, Excuse me, do you realize that Dark Horse is garbage? Yeah. <laughs> we're not going to be that. Um, so, you know. Um, so I, I'll pick some stuff out of there that's interesting, but I do most of my buying out of the middle third of, of previews before you get to the toys, you know, <laughs> and, and sort of the, the smaller press publishers. And I sit there, I put together my spreadsheet and, and send it off to Vault of Midnight, and then they, sh they ship the books to us. And then, so if, if you can get yourself in previews, if you can get Diamond to carry you, I'm likely to at least see your th see that your thing is available. Mm -hmm. uh, now there's more in, in previews than I can possibly buy. Of course, you know I'm buying maybe ten percent. I'm pulling a number out of nowhere <laughs> in there. So there's lots of worthy stuff that I'm not able to to afford uh, to buy every month. Um, but I try to get the highlights, and I try to get stuff. Um, you know, something catches my eye, and that little tiny little tiny box ad in there. Something about that says. Go ahead and buy that. You yeah. know, Dave, it's fifteen bucks <laughs> or twenty bucks or something like that. Which you know, I'm used to. I used to buy engineering books for the library. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, books that are costing two hundred bucks, <laughs> you know, a, a, a piece. I think that's true. Yeah, twenty bucks. I'll take a chance on that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can catch my attention in there, um, then you know, uh, other than that, it, it's it's hit or miss. You know, if, mm -hmm. if you can get my attention. Through your Kickstarter thing, or or I see or or I see somebody tweets about it, you know, and I say, oh, they usually have good taste in comics. Let me go to that website and check that thing out. Mm -hmm. Or if it's a creator whose work I'm familiar with and they're publishing in some odd platform, and I know that it exists, then I can go out, you know, and, and try to find it. Like if James Kachalka is doing a Kickstarter for a thing, you're gonna notice. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um. So um. So yeah. If, if so name recognition can be a thing because that's very hard if you don't have the big, big or, name recognition. Right. Um, so you got to kind of got to kind of get out there and do, do the podcast <laughs> 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 and be be on the social media and yeah. and uh, s and send yourself out to people. Um, send your you know, review copies out to blogs and places like that because um, you know once you can get on somebody's radar, um, then you know there's a sort of explosive. Explosive effect. No. <laughs> that's not the Great. analogy. Now the NSA is listening yeah. to us. <laughs> that's not the analogy I was going for. Uh, no, but 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 I, I think this is an interesting angle on the whole thing. Is that I've been talking for years about how public libraries are the place where cartoonists need to get their work because when you have one book in a library, that means hundreds of people are going to have access to it and see right. it. We're talking about reach again, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but if you're an indie independent publisher that becomes a very difficult thing to do because the 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 main inroad mechanism is unavailable to you and un unless you want to go to every individual library and try to strike up a conversation <laughs> with their selector you 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 you're up against something there but it's interesting that there is a value to previews for an independent publisher if you want to get into an academic library because now well, I, no, the, I don't know that other academic libraries are doing what I do I imagine there's got to be there, more I than just you and like you know places like the Billy Ireland Museum <laughs> and right I mean there's there's it's it's a growing movement but yeah. yeah I mean I'm sure that you are you are in an elite vanguard right now but I gotta I gotta think that that's growing I, I hope so. <laughs> I think comics should be everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but but I mean I'm just saying like it's interesting that like while you don't necessarily have circ numbers, you by having that collection there, you are exposing that work to a lot of people. Right, right. You know, a lot of people use the Deuterstat. Yeah. And, and I mean I use it. I go there to read comics. So I mean as actually I, I think it's one of the top places to get really, really actually it, it takes me back to the days when I fell in love with the medium, and I started discovering people like um, uh, 
Bill Willingham back mm-hmm. in like the late 80s before he was Fables Bill Willingham, you know. Right, when he was doing Elemental. Elementals and stuff. Yeah, yeah. and I was like, and like and they, they tripped this thing. Like I discovered Kamiko Comics and like right. Matt Wagner and stuff. Yeah, there's that point when you when you suddenly became aware that there's more than Marvel and DC and yes. Archie out, out there. And that's what the Duderstadt <laughs> is for me. It's like, what haven't I seen yet? Yeah. I can find it there, right? Yeah, it used to be, you know, you'd go to a good comic store in a big city or something something like that. Because, yeah. you know, when you, when you went down to the... the, the um, uh, the the neighborhood drugstore and the spinner rack and stuff like there. There you know there wouldn't be a lot of choices of of what to get there. And you say, oh, they do these in black and white, and they do things. <laughs> with a, uh, there's more, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I remember you're, that. You're I... like, oh my gosh, and then you realize that there's this whole subculture of of <laughs> independent comics out there. I was 13 and I was at a comic store, my very first like real comic store with a friend, and we opened up some some uh, Mirai Studio stuff. Yeah. And we're like, it's in black and white. Why is it in black and white? <laughs> and like my friend says, I think that means it's for grown ups. <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah, that must be it. <laughs> these, these turtles that are running around and hitting people with nunchucks must be for grown-ups, yeah. <laughs> anyway, but okay, so there's there's other avenues to, like, if you go through previews, um, and, and, I mean, you've got the Comixology app in front of you right now, so yep, you, yep. You, you're getting exposed stuff that way. You're a savvy librarian, a crusty old librarian. You know, I like I like to go down to the, the, the Comixology to submit new releases, and, you know, and you, you page through there, and there might be one or two things that catches my eye, so I... <laughs> Well, you can't click the buy button any- anymore. Yeah. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> <laughs> you can go onto the website and purchase it, and then go through that convoluted a- Amazon way of downloading your stuff to your to your iPad. Yeah. Um, so it's but it is still more convenient than going to a store and hoping that store carries that that comic. Actually, yes. Because yeah. because shelf space is infinite, mm-hmm. r- really in 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 the digital realm. Now, there's a problem with that, and that you know. It's hard to get to some of this stuff to find out that it even exists, even if it's on the Comixology app. You know, it might be on that Comixology submit new releases thing for maybe a week or two, and then it's buried down in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you, if you want to get that long tail effect on your on your digital comic, you almost co- constantly, ha- I think, have to be out there pumping people's attention for it to let yeah. them know that it exists. Because um, just putting it on the virtual shelf doesn't mean that people are going to see it or know that it's there well that's that's a, you you anticipated where i wanted to go with this is jamie is um you know how do you i mean because so black wraith just dropped on comiXology today so everybody who's listening now fire up your app go to <laughs> you know uh, comiXology submit new releases and check out black wraith today twice get a copy <laughs> for a friend uh <laughs> I'm stealing that from Dean Tripp, who was just on the show recently. He was saying that about one of his digital comics. So buy three. Uh, so, but how 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 do you think about this? How do you think about like how do I get this noticed? I mean, is it is just like what Dave was saying? Like just the outreach, going onto the social medias, getting people, awesome people like uh, like uh, Jeremy Burley to talk about you, um, yeah. because when Jer- <laughs> Bur- Jeremy Burley talks, people listen. Like Ian Hutton. Uh, uh, I, it, it is. It's. Um, I realized. Um, you know, you go on Twitter now and you realize that even the the mainstream publishers and even the creators that are working on mainstream books use that, that model. They, they, they still need to, they've got a whole department, a marketing department behind them, but they still have to go on to Twitter and Facebook and announce when stuff is happening because I think that's how most people become aware of it. And, you know, I've done a couple of Kickstarters and I realized that I, the first time you start plug in a Kickstarter that you're doing. You just feel like, oh my God, people are going to be so sick and tired of hearing this. And, you know, day one of 30 and you do it three times and there's the whole, don't do it more than this many times. Um, but then on, you know, you'll be on day 10 and someone will say, oh, I didn't realize you were doing that. And you realize that it's all, it's such a, um, a living world now, um, social media. It, it's not just like a, a uh, forums where you post something and it sits there and people respond to something that's set there. It's actually breathing and moving and changing, especially Twitter. Twitter you, you can post on Twitter and, and it's gone within a couple of minutes and it's back. Yeah, it's and if it's not there in those first couple of pages when I'm scrolling through the however many hundred people I'm following, yeah. I might not see it. That's yeah. true. And uh, I was just I just remembered Steve Lieber who's um gonna be one of the one of the guests at the thing we're gonna be talking about in just a minute. Yep. Um 
tweeted yesterday, pro tip, never ever publicize your own work. Your publisher has your best interest at heart and will always take care of that for you. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can hear Steve's voice, <laughs> yeah. you'll, you'll, you'll feel the sarcasm dripping off that tweet. Yeah, there was, there was a wry smile at the end of that <laughs> one. Yeah, so, okay, that that's actually, I think you're speaking to, Jamie, this this... An assumption that was in the back of my head with like, because I, I I think about like, there's advice like don't don't just tweet your thing once a day, right? Yeah. You gotta do it multiple times a day because people won't see it otherwise. And I'm like, oh, but what about that person who I'm gonna annoy? What about that one guy who I'm gonna <laughs> annoy with saying it twice? Yeah. <laughs> you can say it differently three times during the day. That's right? true. That's yeah. true. Um, but you know, there's people who talk their check their Twitter in the morning and people in the afternoon and the in the evening, and so yeah. it's okay to do it three times a day and mm -hmm. um and believe me most people on twitter aren't just following five people that's true yeah <laughs> they're only following me they're, right they're only following me. Uh, <laughs> but but it's like I, I think about that and I, when you just brought that up jamie i remember when the, when the kickstarter was going on and i don't remember at any point being like oh there's jamie again <laughs> but i think i think part of that is that you have a, a delightful presence too it's like i never read anything that jamie says i'm like oh he's, been, I, he's, he's at it again yeah, i mean yeah. i do find it obnoxious when all a creator does on Twitter is publicize their own work. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I think Twitter is definitely a conversational thing. Yeah, it, it's you know, if it, it's, I, I like to see uh, people ask questions. I like to engage with people on there, and, and you know, I've I've got incredible advice from people on there, and, and uh, bounce ideas back and forth with people on there. So I think it's a real valuable tool in that respect. It's not a place for deep conversations about things, but it's definitely a place, definitely <laughs> a place for a for a uh, for you know a a uh, a party sort of sort of thing, right? You know, yeah, you're exactly. you're you're hanging out and you're you're de and you're just talking instead of talking about the weather, you're talking about comics or whatever it is yeah. that you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you if you need to tweet more than three tweets about us it, as a single response, then you know that it's not the place. <laughs> <laughs> Until you get ca caught up in an Eric Larson. Thing again, where he mm. he gets mad about something and then he starts talking and then like yeah like you get you, it's easy to get uh, caught up in those. I usually yeah. get caught up in reading them more than responding, but <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, he, he knows how to how to fire people up. Uh, Eric J. Larson, on Twitter, people should follow him. <laughs> All right, so we got to get the book recommendations. I cannot believe it. We've we just burned through an hour, Jamie. It wow. it goes so fast. Uh, <laughs> And I always say, like, I always look at the clock, and I'm like, okay, well, we, we're at 15 minutes out. We got to start wrapping up for book recommendations, and then usually that's when like a really interesting idea hits, and then we go down that path, and then all of a sudden it's 1:30, and we got to wrap. But um, before we get to book recommendations, I want to shift gears entirely, and we got to talk about an event that's happening, Dave. That's right. So we got uh, Kids Read Comics, which is the thing that that you and Dan Mishkin and and folks here at AADL and probably some other people I'm forgetting, so I apologize. <laughs> Um, organized this wonderful free celebration of comics for kids. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a convention, but it's it's more it's more than that. It's like a festival. Festival. Yeah. Um, where where uh, you'll you'll have artists um, who who do specifically do comics for kids and teen and teens. Mm -hmm. um, all uh, tabling and and doing uh, giving seminars and doing quick draws and 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 interact interacting with with the fans. Um, pr I would say probably at a deeper level than your typical convention. I would say, yes, that the way I describe it is, is like when you think about when we were kids and we go to conventions, like, oh, you get to go get the thing signed by George Perez. Right. Kids Read Comics is the event where you go and George Perez says, hey, you want to draw with me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, that, and think about like the difference in the, in the, the, the profundity of that, uh, <laughs> that experience, right? right. So, so, um, so uh, this will be our second year of doing a pre-conference for, for that. We did this last year, the, the Comics in the Classroom mm -hmm. uh, pre-conference, and it went really well last year. Um, so we're doing it again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be on Friday, which is the day before, Friday, June 20th, which That's is right. the day before uh, Kids Read Comics proper starts. Um, and this will be at the, most of the activities are going to be at the Harlan Hatcher Graduate Library on the University of Michigan's central campus. Um, and it's intended for uh, librarians and teachers and cartoonists. Um, all, all, all three groups holding hands. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, yeah. Getting, yeah, getting, getting along. <laughs> and it's all about how do you use comics uh, in, a, in a teaching uh, way and how do you, um, how do cartoonists um, Get in and work with with educators, and how do educators uh, bring comics into the classroom and use them as a, a ter teaching and learning tool? And how do librarians build collections that can support that? Mm -hmm. uh, so the morning will be a repeat of of 
of the session that you gave last year, and uh, which is the um, how, how to how to teach a comics workshop or right. how to teach comics even if you don't know how to draw right. is the basic idea. And there's so much material in that workshop that I can do it probably five times in a row it'll and it'll be never different. be the same yeah. <laughs> because it comes with a 61 page kit that that like even if you don't know anything about drawing, you can take that kit and take it into a classroom and teach a comics class. Whether it's teaching how to make comics or using comics to teach another skill, right. like learning, teaching math or teaching yep. sociology, et cetera. So yes, that, that's the first session. Yeah, and, and I sat in on that last year, and I learned stuff in, in there, and I can't draw worth a damn. <laughs> <laughs> As anyone who's seen my mini comics can attest to. <laughs> um, uh, so 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 that was good. And then we're going to do uh, a couple panels. The panels are going to be brand new. Yep. Um, and the f and the f I was trying to bring the thing up here and talk at the same time, which I'm never good at here. So, so yes, the panel is uh, how to uh, in better integrate comics in the classroom is the big idea. And you've got uh, you've got uh, Colby Sharp moderating moderating that panel. And the guests will be Matt Holm of, of Baby Mouse fame yeah. and Ruth McNally Barshaw of Ellie McDoodle, McDoodle fame and Sharon Iverson, who people who listen to this podcast will, will know well. Sharon and, Iverson uh, live! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jim McLean, who did uh, Reading with Pictures, and, and, a, and a couple old friends of mine, Steve Lieber and Sarah Ryan, who, who have both done work for uh, Dark Horse and, and Marvel. Marvel and DC and... And folks like that, uh, they'll be re their former Ann Arbor folks will be returning uh, for this. So that will be a, a fantastic panel. That uh, is that's that is like the the big crossover event again, right? <laughs> right. I mean, like the, all the stars are coming out for this this panel. It's yeah. going to be a great one. And so that's the one thirty panel. Yep. Um, and then the four o'clock panel is how you read and write visually, lean into Artcast. You guys are going to do a live stream. Uh, you you and. Uh, Rob Stenzinger. Rob, yeah, thanks. Did we confirm that we're going to do a live broadcast too? I, okay, we haven't confirmed that yet. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I know, it's it's conceivable. Conceivable. We we are planning to do it live. We uh -huh. um, can, assuming that um, our tech people can work and get that going. But I I don't foresee any problems. But okay, we, you're you're right. We haven't confirmed that, so maybe I shouldn't be saying that we're going to. Well. Do that. Uh, here's the thing. You should come to it in Michigan and see it live and participate in the live studio audience because we're going to be talking about how everybody reads visually, right. right? And like you are reading visuals when you are interpreting visual imagery. And so we talk about visual literacy. It turns out everybody reads visually, and we're going to unbox that with some guests on the Linden Dark cast, broadcasted live from the Harlan Hatcher Graduate, Graduate Library. Library. Yep. And in between the two panels, there'll be an event over at the University of Michigan Art Museum um, mm -hmm. that, uh, that will do uh, sort of looking at Art telling stories um, from, I guess, from a historical perspective, and mm -hmm. sort of how comics sort of fall into the whole, um, the whole um, history of of art and, and, and using art to tell to tell stories. And and how yeah, and how art has been using the tools of comics for centuries. And Dr. Chaburka of the University of uh, Michigan Museum of Art. Yeah. Uh, d walks us through it with a bunch of selection, selection, selected pieces of art, and he helps decode how, like, you know, all these different artists throughout history have been using comics uh, storytelling techniques. So, so, so that's your that's your um, your highbrow yes <laughs> for a portion of the day for that. So, how much does this all cost, Jersey? Uh, well, something like that, a pre-conference of that nature. I'm guessing six, seven hundred bucks a, a head, right? You would think, but no. <laughs> Are you doing your Billy Mays now? Are you going to shout? But use your mic technique. <laughs> this is all free. Uh, it is free to the public. J just like comics read great. Comics read great. <laughs> <laughs> Kids read comics. <laughs> There's too many darn comics <laughs> words in the things I do. The, just but, like kids read comics uh, proper, the, the pre-conference is uh, free. We mm -hmm. do ask, though, for the pre-conference that you register. And so, um, I hopefully Matt will be able to throw this URL up on the up on the screen. But it's mlatcomics.com/krc/cccc, mm -hmm. um, and you can go there. You can see the entire program out there. And then at the bottom of that page is a form. Uh, you're going to want to fill that out so that we know how many folks are coming. Uh, there's already people registered for this, and you, the morning session is rapidly filling up. Oh wow! So if you want to attend, I would say try to do that in the next. 
day or so. Oh, wow. Um, we will wait list people if we run over. Because it's in a room and there's only so many <laughs> only so many places to sit in there. Mm -hmm. um, the same with the, uh, with the event at the Art Museum. That's going to be limited to about 20, 25 people. Uh, but the panels, we're, they're in a... They're in a big room. There's plenty of be plenty of space there. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you know? Even if you forget to register for those, uh, you can show up for those. And we're not going to be checking your tickets at the door for <laughs> uh, for those events. But we do want to, we would like to know how much coffee to order. And, <laughs> and that's right. And There's going like to be coffee. Uh, uh, and yeah, there'll be some kind of refreshments there. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's it. it go to kidsreadcomics.org, and in the sidebar is a, a, an image that says Comics in the Classroom. You can click that. It'll take you to the page where the registration form is. Right. Um, and I am super excited about this. Oh, we should say, the day concludes with a drink and draw. That's right, over at Dominic's, which yep. is a, a local watering hole. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that we uh, that we did last time. So even if you're not able to come to any of the events, uh, and you're a, you're a cartoonist type, and you're in either you're in town for Kids Read Comics, or you're just just want to come and hang out with other folks who draw. Yeah. Uh, last year we put a big sheet of butcher paper up on up on the fence, and people started doodling on it and drawing on it, and people having lots of fun and socializing uh, with folks, and that was. For, I think that was one of the highlights of the of the day, and I'm not I'm not a hangout at the bar kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> You're not. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, the my, my the favorite story I love to tell from this the the, the the drink and draw last year is it's in a restaurant and we had like an area reserved for the artists to all just hang out, artists and librarians to hang out and draw together, and uh, a family shows up, some kid with his parents, and they were just there for dinner for like you know their own reasons, right? They weren't there for our thing. The kid looks over and he sees some of his favorite authors. He sees Rafael Rosado. He sees Ben Hatke. He sees Raina Telgemeier all drawing on this wall. And he's like, can I go draw on the wall? I'm like, yeah, you can go draw the wall. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, imagine you're 10 years old and your parents are like, we're going out to dinner. You're like, ah, nuts. I want to watch TV. I gotta, but I got to go out to dinner with my family. And then you get there and Maurice Sendak is right over there. And he says, hey, you want to draw with me? <laughs> How awesome would that be? That'd be the best. So yeah, that, that, we got to provide that experience for that little kid. Yeah. That was so cool. But yes, it's open to the public. You should come. Um, Dominic's is an 18 or older place. So if you have children, or if you're under 18, you have to be accompanied by an over 18 or over 21, over 21 uh, relative. Yes. Not, so, not just not just some guy you meet who <laughs> will yeah. take you in. It's got to be a, a, uh, a legal relative type person to to get you in for that so. jamie what do i got to do to get you to come to kids read comics one of these years oh i'll come I, I definitely will come i've been very uh um slow to build my convention and, and festival presence just because i've been I, I i'm trapped in my day job where if i'm working i don't have the time and if i'm not working i don't have the money so i'm going <laughs> to juggle that um, i definitely do want to come it's one of those it's one of the shows i definitely do want to go to well, that's that's a whole. We got to have you back because that's a whole other avenue of discussion that I had in my notes for mm -hmm. talking about how conventions figure into a self-publishing strategy. But we'll we'll save it for another time, and maybe we can get some of your compatriots to come on for that one too. I haven't talked to Carl yeah. Anstatter in a long time. I uh, need to get him on again too. So we'll 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 do this again. But uh, it, yes, people should go to kidsreadcomics.org. It's gosh, it's a month away. Oh, and one more thing about Kids Read Comics. This is episode ninety nine. Comics are great. Episode one hundred will happen at Kids Read Comics during that weekend. We're going to do a broadcast of KRC. I'm going to be joined by uh, co-host Greg Schiegel of the Stuff Said Show. We're going to do a, right. a, a joint sh jointly run show together. Okay, so that's all about kidsreadcomics.org for now. So now book recommendations. Do we have any books that we want to promote? Who wants to start? Jamie, I, 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 bl I don't know if I gave you time to think much about it. Yeah, uh, no, you did. I've got a stack of... Uh, <laughs> let's bring up this one here. <laughs> this was something I found on Kickstarter, and then I was um, at um, uh, WonderCon. And the the artist was on the table opposite me. So I actually went over and, and met him, and it's a book called Basewood by uh, Alec Longstreth. He's been doing a series of um, they're, they're kind of zine comics, I guess, um, that you can subscribe to from his site uh, called Phase Seven, I think. Phase Seven comics. Let me just check. Um, yes, and this was part of the. Uh, it's a beautiful book. It's a hardcover that he put out through Kickstarter. Um, and it's part of a story that he ran in the Phase 7 uh, series originally. I think it was like a four or five issue ongoing story. And uh, normally it's very uh, autobiographical, but this was like a little departure for him. And he did the Kickstarter to get the hardcover printed. And uh, 
Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. It's huge as well. Wow. Yeah, it's lovely looking. Uh, and I have not met him yet, but by all accounts, he is a very, very enthusiastic person who loves yeah, comics loves a yeah. lot. Yeah. So. He tries to encourage everybody to create. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, yeah. so there's that. I've got a couple more, if that's all right. If you want me to just run through them. Please. Um, Plastic Farm, Rafa Roberts. Um, here's another guy. I... He's been putting this out as a self-published um, kind of zine comic as well. Um, I think he's on issue 24 or 25 now. I think it's 24, and I'm always massively impressed with anyone who puts out that many books independently. Um, he's on Patreon as well. Um, but he, this, this is a collection, the first collection. It's got three collected editions. Um, but I also, I had the individual books, and then he did a Kickstarter, so I got the, the collected editions through that. And I've been backing him on Patreon. Um, and one of the things he does on Patreon, which is kind of cool, is that you can get a hard copy of the book and a sketch card from him. So, oh, um, wow. So yeah, physical okay. benef uh, bonuses. Yes, exactly. Almost said physical benefits, and that sounds like something <laughs> else. <laughs> Still a family show, Jersey. <laughs> More, there's uh, Old City Blues. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Giannis and Giannis. His work, uh, it's... Uh, uh, in uh, New Athens in the future. It's a kind of Blade Runner-esque story. Um, ties into uh, that book. Not ties into, but it kind of plays along the lines of Blade Runner meets Pluto. Um, oh, uh, wow. Um, yeah, he's a great creator. He just, it, it, this is like, a, this is the second book, but he, he just seems to pour out work. He's like, a, he's one of those creators that just seems to sit down and, and churn out work and, and <laughs> I, I love it. It's a great book. It's a really, really good read. Uh, and the last one is, I say one, but it's a collection. Oh, my. Oh, wow. <laughs> which is uh, Evan Downs' series. This is the new one, which is uh, Batu. Um, and again, this is all stuff that I found through Kickstarter um, and kind of backed up through Kickstarter. He's done, this is the second book he did, which is Rice Boy, which is the site that he publishes everything up on. Uh, which is rice-boy.com, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, he's, it's like a, a huge fantasy series, ongoing fantasy series. This is the first arc, which was called The uh, Order of Tales, but one, two, and three. He's on like page 500 of the, the current story, and he puts out maybe two pages a week. And, and it's just, it's beautiful stuff. It's so beautifully designed. I mean, this is the, the black and white early stuff, and he's, he's getting better from there. It's like a, the, the second book kind of goes like uh, like almost like Yellow Submarine in some of the design work. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just really, it's so well written. The, the character interplay and the, the, the storytelling is beautiful. So I highly recommend that. So and all, all and, indie guys. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and another one which I don't have to hand, it's over, over in my bedroom there, uh, <laughs> is uh, uh, Copper, Michael. Faith's Copra, which is uh, he's putting out a book. He, he did uh, 12 issues monthly, um, self-published, um, and you can only get it through him, I think. I think he has an Etsy store, which he has books. There's a collected edition coming out, and it's, it's great. It's, it's his uh, play with time and panel design and how, you, how the eye flows across stuff and how you read it to, to match a certain pace that he wants is really well done. And uh, I think that the collected edition is coming out soon. Um, I think he's on issue 14 at the moment. He just had a subscription service up, which I got. So he's really good. It's like a Suicide Squad um, in the 80s story, like that um, Joe Strander kind of storytelling. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's a really good artist as well, so recommend that. Very cool. Uh, and that, that actually reminds me of something I meant to say about the Hero Code and uh, the Black Wraith is that it, you can tell when you're reading them that, they, that you are definitely trying to maximize comics storytelling potential instead of writing something that, well, eh, this could also be turned into a TV show down the road. <laughs> you know? I mean, and it could, and that'd be great because that means money that you can make more things with, but I, I always appreciate it when I read a comic that feels like, oh, he's... he's actually leveraging what makes comics or what what makes comics so unique through mm. his storytelling right 
Uh, always, always appreciative of that. And I mean, the general reader, who cares? They don't care. But as a, as a cartoonist, I always am delighted when I see it. I'm like, oh, that's nice. I'm, I'm glad he did that, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, and it's it, obviously you're responding to that in other people's work as well. So, Dave Carter, what do you got? Yeah, so I realized this weekend that I read a couple of comics that were set during the Revolutionary War. <laughs> uh, so, like, well, there's a theme. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't know where I hold these up. Hold this up here. Yeah, there we go. So this is the latest volume of the Black Coat. I guess it came out back in November. Um, it's by currently it's Ben Licious is, is writing it, and the art currently by Dean Cotts. Although the earlier volumes, Francesco Francavilla was doing mm -hmm. was doing the art on that. Um, and it's it's basically the Black Coat is sort of a Batman uh, Green Hornet type superhero, <laughs> but he's operating in. Uh, Boston, New York area during the Revolutionary War period, oh, wow. and uh, and so this uh, and he's sort of hooked up with the with the um, insurrectionists and uh, you know going in and um, hit, hitting those red coats you know who are trying to stop <laughs> who are trying to stop the insurrection. So and he's he's on our he's side. On, he's on our he's on not the, on Jamie's uh, side. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <Sounds> awful. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and. Um, and so, and there's also a, sort of an occult element going on. There's a, there's a secret society of occultists out there who are who who are maybe are sort of help, helping the British, but maybe not really. Maybe they have their own agenda, and so they're sort of inserted into into the mix. Um, and the uh, this is the fourth uh, collection, fourth volume of it. Uh, it's called The Blackest Die, and this one kicks off like on July 6, 1776. So they've sort of just declared independence, and the war is just officially. Uh, begun mm -hmm. and now they're tr they're trying to get out of town before they get you know burned out by the by those n nasty vicious redcoats. Sorry, Dave. I don't know. This, <laughs> I don't know. This sounds awfully educational no. to me. Oh well, you, <laughs> but it's got superheroes in it, right? You, you so. might you might accidentally learn something when you're reading this. <laughs> and I'm not a historian, so I have no idea how accurate the history is there. Right. But it's, but it's a ripping good you know superheroes set set during the past. Uh, sort of yarn. Uh -huh. um, and the other one, I'll be surprised if Sharon hasn't mentioned this before on the podcast, uh, The Dreamer by, by Laura, Laura Innes. Laura Innes. Yeah. Uh, so I just read the second uh, volume. This is actually a webcomic. You can go onto her website and read the whole thing for free. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're like me and you like the feeling of paper in your hands when you're reading your comics, uh, IDW has published uh, the collections of it. Uh, so this is a, a historical time travel romance comic uh, where our, our main character, uh, shoot, what's her name? Ah, Beatrice. <laughs> Beatrice, she's a 17-year-old girl living in 21st century America, going to high school. And when she, and one day when she falls asleep, she has this very vivid dream that she's back uh, during the Revolutionary w War, mm -hmm. and she's hooked up with again with the insurrectionists. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know she falls madly in love with, with this with, you know, with the one general or lieutenant or whoever whoever it is. And there's a whole romance thing going on there. And then there's a romance thing going on in the present day. She wakes up and she's or she falls asleep in the dream world. She wakes up in the present day and she falls. Then the next day it happens again. She falls asleep and she goes back. So she's living these two lies um mm. one one is a dream and one is a real one is reality and um and so th but it's 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 romance <laughs> it's it's unabashed that sort of that sort of thing being told in a kind there's no superheroes in here at all but there yeah. but there are people doing heroic things because you know it's set during during a time of great conflict yeah um so it's um it's another so she's out there um, you know, doing the stuff on the web and, and well, yeah, and Laura, Laura, Laura Innes is amazing, and she also uh, does a show called the Paper Wings Podcast. Which, if you're a fan of this show and the kinds of discussions you find here, you'll probably dig that as well. So, you could, yeah. so, so yeah, Fourth of July is coming up. So, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna get, um, if you wanna get in the mood for for shooting <laughs> off some firecrackers, um, there's a couple of good comics I think that'll. You well for that. Ah, that's good. Nicely done. All right, my, my recommendation, I've recommended this before, and I only bring it up because I think this book shares a lot of DNA with the kind of work Jamie's doing. Um, and if you go, first, I'm going to say go to uh, Comixology and get the Black Wraith, which just came out today. Get that first. <laughs> then get this. Um, so the, the Kids Comics Revolution Awards were just announced. The nominees were, uh, it's, it's an award show an award put on by the Ann Arbor District Library and me and Dave Roman and Chris Duffy of uh, Nickelodeon Magazine, SpongeBob Comics, uh, put together an awards ceremony for to recognize people in comics who are making comics for kids. And one of the guys who is nominated, and I'm not saying vote for him, I'm just saying this is an opportunity to check out the works of a lot of worthy artists who are making comics for young people. 
But G-Man by Chris Giruso um, is, it's this amazing thing where it's, it's rip-roaring, colorful, bombastic superheroes that I love as a grown-up, but it's totally made for kids. And it does all the things that superheroes does right, where it's like, it's unironically crazy. Like, like, like there's this team of superheroes and led by Captain Thunderman. <laughs> And it's not like it's not like a Family Guy joke where it's like, oh, well, I'm gonna go. Thunder Man's gonna go sit on the thunder bucket and make a thunder, you know, whatever. Uh, no, it's just like, why wouldn't you have a superhero called Captain Thunder Man? You know, I mean, in the Hero Code, you have a guy called Opti Man, like optimized man kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, it, but it's about uh, two brothers, and one of them finds a piece of magic cloth that uh, allows him to fly, and then his older brother, who's kind of like a jerk sometimes, stole a piece of the cloth, turned into a belt so he can fly. And it's all about them getting involved in this world of superheroes and uh, you know government super agencies and awesome fights and hijinks, but it's all perfectly kid-safe, but it's also really thrilling for adults. Um, this book doesn't get enough attention, and I hope that through the awards, the Kids Comics Revolution Awards, we can make more people aware of this amazing series. So this is book three. There's two other books out from Image Comics by Chris Giruso, G-Man. And then I'm going to do a self-service. All thing. right, go for it. <laughs> I don't use my own platform to promote myself that often, but I've got a book coming out in September. Uh, called the Warren Commission Report, a graphic investigation into the Kennedy assassination. That is a mouthful. Uh, and I, I, I'm one of the artists on it. Dan Mishkin wrote it. Ernie Cologne uh, illustrated it. And I, uh, I kind of ran the road shotgun with Ernie Cologne. I did like the layouts of the book, which in this galley, you can actually see some of my uh, layouts that I did. You know, I thumbnailed it. And then Ernie and I collaborated on the actual final art of the book. And what it is, is it's, a, it's an investigation of the Warren Commission report. So Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, and then the Warren Commission was assembled. Uh, Earl Warren uh, and uh, Gerald Ford and a bunch of other guys were assembled to figure out who did it, what happened here. Was it Oswald? Was it somebody else? And this is an, a, a visual evaluation of all of the facts and the theories, and I'm not going to tell you what conclusion that the book comes to. Um, <laughs> But it's also about like what was going on at the time. It's also from Dan Mishkin's experience as a twelve year old when it happened. You know, there's a whole sequence that we do in here where it's about him him as a boy finding out the news. Um So this is very much in the vein of the nine eleven report that, that Ernie Ernie Cologne did, yeah. Work, worked on and yeah. same is it the same publisher who did No, no it's, it's a different publisher. publisher. Okay. It was Abrams Comics Art Comic Arts who's putting this out. So um but not the most pleasant material to spend uh, a lot of time up close with <laughs> as a cartoonist, but 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 the book is is not it's not gory or, or gruesome. I mean, there's like there's obviously there's autopsy scenes in the book, but it's all we we, we framed all the shots so as to avoid the gore. So, so you could give this to a 13 year old and it'd be perfect. Absolutely, fine on it. Yeah. absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I mean that's one of my personal rules as a as a cartoonist is I won't do anything over PG 13 anyway. But I will say that there is a page in this book that when I drew it, I got goosebumps. Mm. And I'll, I'll leave it to you to buy the book and find figure out. Figure out which page it was. Which, which page <laughs> was it? But in, 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 amazingly, it was a very simple page. It's nothing where I did something really exquisite with the layout and like, oh, I did something that only comics can do. It's just the, when I read the script, the visuals instantly came to mind. And that's when you know you got a great script, right? Uh, but I was, I was penciling it, and I... I texted Dan. I was like, oh my God, I got honestly got goosebumps just now. And that doesn't happen every day when you're making comics. So, All right. So uh, that's all our book recommendations. you got to come to Kids Read Comics this summer to see, check out episode 100 of Com Comics Are Great. And thank you, Jamie, for making all the time to hang out with us and talk comics today. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, what's the one thing you want people to go to today if they enjoyed your, your presence on the show? Ooh. Um... Uh, monkeypipestudios.com where the, they'll get a flavor of the different books that we've got coming out and uh, everything kind of flows through there. That'll be a good place to go. Intronauts, when is that coming out? <clears throat> that is, um, I have the first eight pages of art and it's kind of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very freeform story. <laughs> yeah. so it's taken me a lot longer to get back to it. To, I've got 20 or so pages scripted, and I'm kind of working on a one shot, a Black Rave one shot at the moment that's put intronauts to one side. Um, but I'm hoping to get something up on there pretty soon, hopefully. What, what I've seen looks really, really cool. Um, hmm. But that's, you can go to monkeypipestudios.com to check out the Black Wraith, Department O, Hero Code, Intronauts, Meet Space, Omnitarium, uh, Slate and Ash, 
Uh, wow, there's a lot of different books on here. Uh, what, yeah. what's, this one? <laughs> what's this one? This one is Samurai Billy. Oh, yeah, yeah I've seen this one before. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is really cool, too. Uh, and then you could also go to uh, jamiegamble.com, right? To Because uh, you also do sketch cards, and I actually brought a sketch yes. card that you did <laughs> for me. <laughs> it's Jared, the Abominable Snowman with a butterfly. You could actually get, so like Jamie the writer is also Jamie the artist, and he does really cool sketch cards that you can get on his website as well, which we will link to in the show notes. It's mm -hmm. jamiegamble.com. That's where you blog too, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but yes, we will have to do this again, Jamie, so we can dig deeper mm -hmm. into this topic. Um, yeah. All right, but uh, then in, in the meantime, then the only other thing for you, Dave, is just to talk about just promoting the pre-conference. Yeah, so if, if that sounded interesting to you, and it should, um, then and you're going to be in town, uh, then you can uh, please register. So I, so, I know, <laughs> so, so I know you're coming. For God's sake, <laughs> register. register. <laughs> we don't need 300 people showing up going where's the coffee <laughs> uh, alright so thank you Dave for making time to be on the oh, show thank you, Jersey. I appreciate and picking it. this apart with us So, uh, and thank you to Matt Dubay and Eric Kloster in the control room for you know keeping track of all the links that we were talking about and putting together the show notes for me and manning the control boards and thanks to the Ann Arbor District Library for letting me put on the show every couple weeks we'll be back in a month for KRC the kidsreadcomics.org and you can participate in the show live until then, everybody, I have been Jersey Droz of comicsagreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. <laughs>